I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. On this episode, we hear from University of Virginia history professor Chris McMillan. He has studied the societal effect of pandemics such as the plague, the 1918 flu, and HIV-AIDS. He joins Q&A to explain some of the history of past pandemics to give context to the current coronavirus outbreak. Christian McMillan, UVA historian and associate dean for social sciences, author of a book on pandemics. I wanted to ask you as we start out, are there any historical precedents for what the world is experiencing with experiencing right now with COVID-19? Yeah, there are several. I think the most recent um, one that comes to mind and probably has come to most everyone else's mind is the 1918 influenza pandemic in terms of its rapidity, uh, how fast it spread across the world and um, its scope and expanse. In the 19th century, the cholera epidemics would be the most... Um, the clearest analogy. We're going to have an opportunity to dig into some of those lessons sure. from history a bit more. But when you look at the response, of course, things are so much different for society now. So uh, you talk about how important it is to learn lessons from pa- past pandemics and epidemics. What lessons have we clearly learned? What lessons have we clearly learned? That's a good question. I'm, I'm uh, only smiling because as a historian, it's not always clear we've learned a uh, we've learned lessons from the past. I think that the one that we've probably imbibed the most uh, is to roll out things as methodically as possible, to um, pay attention to reliable news sources, uh, to do our best to um, uh, 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 hold off on, on blaming uh, uh, certain sectors of society for spreading pandemics. We're not seeing a tremendous amount of that this time. Uh, so the clampdown on misinformation uh, perhaps is, is, um, is one of the lessons we've learned that I see playing out now. That's not to say there isn't misinformation. Well, the flip side of the question is, are you clearly seeing patterns of being repeated? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the patterns, I think, that are being repeated are... Um, and if you look at the 1918 epidemic, is a, is a variety, uh, a tremendous variety of responses um, from you know within countries, within states, within uh, uh, around the world. You know, you've got Italy responding in one way, you've got China responding in another way, and that's not to say that there are examples from the past where the entire world responded the same way. That's clearly not the case. Um, I think that the other thing that we're seeing that's very similar to 1918 and to the early years of cholera is a mixture of uh, you know fear anxiety and 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 panic some examples of panic but on the other hand um, not taking things seriously quickly enough uh, especially in the United States uh, during 1918 the, the range of responses uh, was quite remarkable from taking it seriously to to thinking of it as just an extreme version of the common cold. Well, staying with that, one of the debates people were seeing on social media and probably still even continuing today is, listen, there's flu every year. Uh, Thousands of people die from it. So what do we learn from history about the difference about a novel virus like this and the seasonal flu? Um, I think I understand uh, the question. I mean, it seems to me that... uh, Thinking of some, I mean, analogizing the um, medically the coronavirus to the flu, uh, you know, and 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 suggesting that it's no worse than the the common uh, yearly flu is is seems to me a bad idea in several respects. The the flu has, as we know, morphed into a global pandemic on multiple occasions. So, in my mind, uh, actually, the analogy should be more to be concerned about. Um, comparisons to the flu rather than uh, the reaction to be not concerned when we compare to the flu. In other words, the flu in 1918 in particular, but in the 1890 to 92 pandemic are two of the worst, if not the worst, pandemics in world history. So comparing it to the flu in my mind is cause for concern, not cause for complacency. The um, NIH has a graph that uh, helps people understand when things become pandemics, and they include these uh, these uh, 
these metrics, wide geographic extension, disease movement, high attack rates and explosiveness, minimal population immunity, novelty, infectiousness, contagiousness, and severity. All mm-hmm. the ones from history we're going to talk about that c- clearly fit into those criteria. But uh, I'm wondering about the inf- infectiousness versus contagiousness. What, what is the difference there? Well, you know, I, I, I'm a historian, and so I, he- I hesitate to answer questions that have, um, you know, real medical meanings behind them. Um, you know, that refers to, though, to the, the, the ease with which one can catch a disease. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I want to, le- honestly, on medical questions, I'd like to leave it at that. Sure. It just be- yeah, I understand. It's just right. irresponsible. Yes, I understand. Um, you referenced one aspect of it, and that's the role of fear in pandemics. Mm-hmm. Um, on a continuum, I would say, on one level, public health officials and government officials want the public to to be anxious enough that they pay attention, uh, but not move all the way to panic. So, can sure. you talk about the role of fear in uh, in in harnessing past pandemics? Yeah, I mean, you know, the in every past pandemic from the Black Death through um, you know, plague as it, tr- it made its way across early modern Europe to cholera in the 19th century, yellow fever, etc., all the way through flu. Fear is a clear element of every single one. And, uh, and you're right. I mean, there's got to be a balance between informing the public in a way that makes them want to pay attention. Um, uh, But there's a balance, of course, between setting off waves of panic. You know, in the pandemics that I've just noted, cholera, influenza, and the plague, um, you know, that's been an unsuccessful balance at various times and places. In every single one of those, there's been, um, you know, quite uh, quite remarkable waves of panic and fear. Um, And... It comes from, it seems to me, the, the way people naturally react to things that are novel, that are fast-moving, that are not well understood, uh, that, and that cause, obviously, you know, uh, disease and, and anxiety and death. Um, in the case of all three of those, fear has played an enormous role in, um, uh, in, in the progress of those pandemics. And during 1918... In Great Britain, uh, there's clear examples of suppressing information regarding the pandemic purely to not cause a secondary pandemic of fear. The same was true in, in Italy. So uh, one question overall, since you uh, are currently even teaching courses on the history mm-hmm. of disease, are there more pandemics today than there have been in history? That's a good question. I, you know, honestly, I've never really thought about it in that way. Not just, it's a good question. And it's, it's difficult for me to quantify it. You know, I, I, in the, in the book that you referred to that I wrote, Pandemics, um, in a very short introduction, it is a this small little book. Um, I, tr- I talked about what, at least from a historical perspective and not necessarily an epidemiological one, um, the difference between you know pandemics like we're seeing right now, coronavirus, and thinking back in time to the flu, and then what I call in the book persistent pandemics, which I thought of as you know malaria, cholera, uh, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS. Um, these pandemics, particularly tuberculosis and HIV, that that by all measures, um, by the you know the eight criteria you read before, um, are pandemics, but they're very different in terms. You know, they're not acute. Uh, they don't have a clear beginning and end. Um, so when you factor those in, it seems to me that it's quite possible we are dealing with more pandemics than we had in the past. I mean, in 1918 and 1900, 1850, um, we didn't have HIV, for example. Um, but to be honest, I've never, I've never really quantified it in the way you're asking, although it's an interesting question. One thing that has happened with every pandemic, it, it, we, the world has become more digitally in, uh, interconnected and, of course, physically interconnected. Mm-hmm. People with populations are moving more. What impact does that have on pandemics? Well, it's the single most important uh, driver of pandemics since the Black Death, since 1347, uh, when when the Black Death arrived in Europe, uh, it's been very very clear since then that that the interconnectedness of the world, even at the time, you know, in the 1340s and early thir- late 1340s, early 1350s, 
was the principal driver of getting ep- epidemics, uh, the epidemic of plague into almost all parts of Europe uh, because of trade networks, travel networks, um, and that has been absolutely the case uh, for all pandemics since. So cholera, when it first arrived in England and the United States in the early 1830s, you know, it wouldn't necessarily have arrived with the speed it did in 1730 as opposed to 1830. Uh, so all pandemics... Um, rely entirely on the on human uh, movement. Pandemics themselves only move uh, based on, on human movement. In the coronavirus, we uh, saw the first instances of it in January of 2020. There was a, a, a waiting by the public health system for the, the World Health Organization to actually declare it a pandemic. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to have you talk a little bit about the role of the World Health Organization. You write about it and how it came into being and, and how it functions. Sure. Um, so the World Health Organization um, emerged like other United Nations organizations out of in the wake of World War II, and um, initially, and its role has changed over the last you know, 60 plus, 70 plus years, uh, but very initially it emerged as a way to deal with the clear health problems uh, as a result, A, of the war, um, but, but B, as a way to start thinking about um, what's now called the developing world, which, uh, um, and its way, the way in which the developing world could... Um, could meet the developed world in terms of its uh, health infrastructure, its response to infectious disease, and so forth. And so the World Health Organization initially really focused on countries that had been particularly hard hit by World War II and then branched out very, very quickly by the late 1940s um, into India uh, and Southeast Asia and then subsequently into Africa. And they really worked on the major diseases that were flourishing in those parts of the world, again, particularly um, Africa uh, and South Asia, other parts of the world as well, but to focusing on diseases like tuberculosis uh, and malaria, for example, um, environmental sanitation. And, you know, for the first couple of decades of the, um, in, the, uh, in the post-World War II period, the WHO was, by any measure, the principal world health authority, both in terms of research, uh, in terms of setting policy, uh, and in terms of setting up responses on the ground. There really was nothing else like it. Um, There were some organizations like the Medical uh, Research Council of Great Britain that also um, deployed doctors around uh, British colonies and so forth. And the WHO maintained this role as, you know, the principal driver of, again, healthcare policy around the world, um, interventions and research. Uh, throughout the 1960s, uh, running the malaria eradication campaign, running the BCG vaccination campaign for tuberculosis, the largest vaccination um, enterprise in world history, the, uh, and then the smallpox eradication campaign throughout the 1970s until its successful ad- eradication in the late 1970s. Beginning in the 1980s, the WHO started to be um, more and more underfunded, and other competing organizations, or not necessarily competing in the literal sense of the word, but, um, you know, the World Bank began to invest more and more in global health. Uh, private philanthropies began to emerge, the, and, of course, most recently, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the WHO has maintained its position as, a, as, a, as an authority in terms of um, directives, direction, defining pandemics, and so forth but doesn't have the same on-the-ground response capacity um, or role it had in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. It's also, um, uh, as I said, in the last generation or so, been increasingly uh, less well-funded. Do uh, American public health uh, agencies, the NIH or the CDC, have international status? uh, And are they, in fact, superseding the role of the WHO? That's a good question. Um, I would th- the CDC, um, in some instances, I would say yes. The NIH, in terms of its you know its authority and its research capacity, uh, uh, has superseded the the World Health Organization in terms of its research capacity. Uh, I think in terms of uh, you know the number one leading body looking you know when when the world looks to define things like pandemics, uh, 
um, and uh, you know what should be done on a global scale. I think people still turn to the WHO for that first line of, of advice, first line of uh, policy direction. Um, so I want to dig in a little bit more to some of the history that you've referenced with these, yeah. but let me start out with just by asking the question, as a historian with a specialty in, in pandemics and epidemics, how did you get interested? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, my, originally, I, and I still teach and, and write on American Indian history, that was um, my first area of research, and, and as you may or may not know, and as others may or may not know, uh, infectious disease, crowd-based diseases, epidemic diseases have had a unique effect on American Indian history in a variety of different ways over time. Um, but what, and so in my classes, I was you know, beginning to teach more and more on the effects of disease amongst American Indians. Um, but really specifically, my research has always been on the 20th century, and it became clear to me as I got more and more interested in disease and in, in, in my teaching that in my research areas, you know, disease was having a tremendous impact still well into the 20th century. And I'm thinking about diseases like, um, you know, crowd diseases, really, uh, as a result of living in poverty on Indian reservations, particularly tuberculosis, the number one killer of American Indians up until the 1960s. And it, historians hadn't spent a lot of time looking at these things, contem- you know, more contemporary diseases. And I started seeing analogies between the experience of uh, people in, for example, South Africa or East Africa, India, and American Indians. You know, why were these kinds of populations becoming more ravaged by tuberculosis than others? And, and that kind of, as historians tend to do, it cascaded from there into a series of questions. And I began to look at the kinds of interventions that, that health authorities were, um, were designing around tuberculosis, particularly vaccination and eventually antibiotics. Many of those drug regimens were tested on American Indian reservations and then rolled out around the world. Some of the most pioneering research in, again, vaccination and antibiotic treatment for tuberculosis were pioneered um, amongst American Indian communities. And then those interventions were rolled out across the planet. So a question, do the public health organizations turn to people like yourself who have historical mm-hmm. context in helping to develop uh, future responses? Um, you know, once in a while, um, you know, I have good, a good friend and colleague, Randall Packard at Johns Hopkins, who's written extensively on malaria um, and global health since World War II. I know that he's been consulted. Um, historians like Howard Markle at University of Michigan um, has written extensively in the American Journal of Public Health and the Journal of the American Medical Association on, on a variety of things. Uh, but um, what comes to mind most recently is a, really a classic article on, on the non-pharmaceutical responses and interventions to the 1918 flu pandemic that he wrote with, some, with, uh, with medical doctors. Uh, it's an extraordinary article published in the JAMA. Um, so historians do get involved in trying to think through how history can help um, uh, contemporary public health responses. But, you know, as I write in my, my book, uh, the pandemics book, and, and more extensively in my tuberculosis book, there, there doesn't seem to be a, um, a tremendous appetite for uh, learning from the past. And clearly, society would benefit if there were. Uh, I think so, but a historian would say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask, what, what is the earliest recorded pandemic? What do historians turn to? Sure. Um, you know, so the, the uh, plague of Justinian um, and then the first instance of what we think almost certainly in the, in the, in the sixth century was the uh, first instance of plague. Uh, now, doing retrospect, what's called retrospective diagnosis to determine what a disease was that occurred, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 years ago in some instances is really challenging. You know, you have textual evidence that describes a disease that sounds like what we know now of as plague. Um, but there has been some uh, research on, uh, on uh, you know, fossil remains, uh, skeletal remains, and so forth, uh, that's largely confirmed that this um, Justinian epidemic was was the plague. The, this, the, pla- the, the epidemic pandemic, really, that historians have focused on 
uh, the earliest one, rather, that historians have focused on more than any other is the Black Death um, that arrived in Europe in 1347 and, and, and lasted until 1352. That's, that's the one, really, that, you know, in, when I teach, I begin there because it, it, it really um, kicks off this period of, um, even though it was so long ago, of, of responses to epidemics that we still see, things like quarantine, fear, and so forth. One of the uh, interesting aspects of uh, the history of civilization being related to the history of disease, you write in the book about, uh, at, at that period of time, of course, being ill was looked at as a punishment from God. And at, mm. at some point that began to shift into understanding contagion, which mm-hmm. then gave more, less power to churches and more power to the state. Mm. I found that an interesting concept. Would you talk about that? Sure. So, you know, you can imagine at a time when... Um, when something like the plague, for example, arrives in, in Europe in you know, 1347. So let me just say briefly, if it's okay, that the, the Black Death um, really is the first instance of plague uh, uh, in the second wave of, of pandemics, uh, bla- of, of plague. You know, it's this very uh, concentrated period between 1347 and 1352. Um, and that, that really defines what we think of as the Black Death, those years. And then plague itself... Uh, remained epidemic and, and pandemic in Europe um, uh, through the end of the 17th century and in some isolated instances into the 18th century um, before it really vanished from Europe. Um, and so over that period of time, you have this first arrival, people having no idea what's going on here, very uh, very different conceptions of how diseases are transmitted than we uh, have now and that they would even have 100 years hence. Uh, but also a society that was, you know, largely um, uh, largely believed in God and looked for direction as to how the world worked and why things happened to God. Um, over time, of course, and as in many instances, in many ways, of as as early modern life in Europe developed, uh, God started to be replaced by um, science. I don't want to overcharacterize this sort of classic battle between faith and, and religion. Um, but you can see it played out in the ways in which people began to respond to, um, to plague. So, for example, in one of my favorite books, uh, Faith, Reason, and the Plague by Carlos Cipolla, it's a classic of, of the history of epidemics, and it, he's, he does it all in, I believe, about 76 pages. It's one of the, uh, the best books you can read on how epidemics affect a small place. He looks at how when plague arrived in this little town called Monte Lupo in, um, in Tuscany in the mid-1630s, it was at a time when, when the, the town itself, in many respects, was still governed by religious authorities. And the church was the center of, of all activity, social activity, to an extent economic activity, but obviously religious activity. But at the same time, uh, Italy is beginning has begun um, to really form... A, what we would think of as a, a modern public health infrastructure. Um, some of the first examples of, uh, of public health infrastructure, specific hospitals to contain disease within, um, uh, placing restrictions on travel, official restrictions on travel, uh, quarantine, um, and these, these measures being run by the state uh, and not by the church. And what, what Cipolla does in this extraordinary book, this tiny little book, is show how the the forces of faith and the forces of of science and reason. Again, I don't really want to draw. I don't want to make it seem as if those two those none of, you know people can't embody all of those things at one time. Um, but how church authorities and state authorities clashed over the best response to the plague as um, understandings of transmission began to change. And so, the church uh, was very committed to the notion that prayer and gathering together uh, in a mass would be the best way for the community to come together to uh, fight off the ravages of plague and, and, and tamp down um, this epidemic, and again, in this tiny little place. Um, whereas public health authorities in Italy at the time thought otherwise, that in fact getting together as emerging ideas about contagion uh, started to take hold, that getting together, in fact, was the single worst thing people could do. So it really became this clash between state authority and church authority. 
uh, for the time being, in the 1630s, church authorities uh, won out. The power of the church and the power of people's belief was more powerful than, um, than the emerging um, doctrines of state public health. Uh, by you know the time cholera arrived, disease ex- explanations for disease had changed um, once again, and in many re- other aspects of life, you know, relying on one's religious beliefs to explain all that occurred in the world uh, had diminished even further from the 17th century. So, in the 1830s uh, and into the 40, 1840s and 50s, the um, explanations for how cholera was being transmitted relied less on explanations based in faith than they did in competing explanations based in in science. Uh, But carrying that all the way to today, Mm. you write that the laboratory revolution, Mm. uh, which certainly began in the uh, the 20th century, early 20th century, uh, cultivated, this is a quote, an undue amount of Mm. confidence in the role Mm. of biomedicine. What are you saying Mm. there? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and it's something I, tr- I try to focus on, um, as, you, as you note in, in the book, and it's also something I really try hard to focus on with my students in my, my class on, on epidemics, pandemics, and history at UVA, is that, so imagine in the, ni- in the mid-19th century, before the laboratory revolution, before diseases like cholera, tuberculosis, typhus, et cetera, were isolated and identified as these single diseases, um, you know, you might want to, you might try, and you would in fact try to um, get rid of cholera by a broad suite of public health measures, um, from cleaning the water to quarantine to uh, other forms of isolation um, to uh, broad scale epidemi- epidemiological research. Um, and then you fast forward 100 years later to the 1950s and the 1960s, um, and you're trying to deal with tuberculosis in in Kenya, for example, um, and you've got antibiotics. Well, the impulse on the part of almost all um, public health officials, the World Health Organization, the British Medical Research Council, is to focus entirely on uh, an antibiotic approach to curing tuberculosis. So not necessarily focusing on malnutrition or the problems with housing that are causing the disease in the first place, for example. Um, It's focusing solely on curing the disease rather than trying to get rid of the conditions that are giving rise to disease in the first place. Um, And so it's a a change in approach from a a broad-based public health approach uh, to changing the conditions that give rise to disease to treating the disease itself once it's already arrived. I mean, you can see the same uh, way of um, approaching cholera, for example, um, in the late 1960s and early 1970s um, as uh, oral rehydration therapy emerges. It's a miraculous cure for cholera, um, and it's very inexpensive, but it doesn't do anything to... um, to, to treat the conditions that give rise to the disease. And so it's a, it was a shift after the laboratory revolution to, um, to thinking, again, less about the conditions that give rise to disease and more how to cure and get rid of diseases once they have already arrived. And in the 1918 flu uh, pandemic, you see this most clearly in... Um, <clears throat> in Great Britain, in, in parts of um, Central Africa, and in, in India, uh, and elsewhere, where um, you know, it's, it, it's not quite the height of the laboratory revolution, but it is at a time when, when the laboratory revolution is taking over, and many medical professionals are convinced that tuberculosis, I mean, not tuberculosis, sorry, influenza is a bacterial infection. Virology is in its infancy at the time, and that um, you see a tremendous efflorescence of what we now would think of as quack remedies to uh, to influenza, based on this kind of hubristic approach to uh, disease. You know that that 
medical science will will take care of it rather than broad public health measures. Well, digging more deeply into the history of flu, which you do write mm-hmm. about in your book, uh, the the major f- uh, flu seasons that, that became plan- pandemics often cited, 1918, which you've talked about a few times, mortality mm-hmm. rate of 50 million, the 57-58 Asian flu, H2N2, 1.1 million mortality, 68, mm-hmm. the Hong Kong flu, H3N2, 1 million mortality, mm-hmm. uh, t- 2009, the swine flu, 575,000. Should we, in the current context, take some comfort in the fact that those mortality rates have been dropping so much, or is there some other causality there? Well, I mean, you know, uh, with, and I know I, I hate to ha- repeat myself on this one, but I, I hesitate to offer any kind of prognostications, you know, outside of my, my realm of expertise. Um, so with that caveat in mind, uh, the fact that that 1918, the mortality was one, one thing, and then it seems to have gone, it decreased in these subsequent flu pandemics. doesn't strike me as a w- reason to think uh, that the coronavirus um, will be uh, any less or more uh, virulent and um, present uh, any more or less great of a, of a mortality rate. The reason I say that is because they're different diseases, and they are... And, this is novel. Um, it is not something uh, that we've seen before. And so I think that taking comfort in a reduction in mortality over the 20th century in influenza pandemics would, would be a mistake in, um, in thinking about uh, the novel coronavirus. What do we know from history about the origin of flu? What do we know from history about mm-hmm. the origins of the flu? Um, well, in in uh, what we what we what we know now about the origins of flu actually is from uh, from virologists and biomedical scientists who've studied samples of particularly the 1918 flu to determine its origins, uh, largely now determined to be in in um, in uh, waterfowl and birds. There, av- it's, it was an avian influenza. Uh, at the time, in 1918 and 1890, 92, no one knew where it came from. Um, we still don't understand uh, why the 1918 flu was so virulent. Um, uh, we, d- we know, of course, as you've already suggested, that the, the subsequent pandemics were less virulent, but we don't necessarily know why. And at that point, what was the role of the military in spreading the flu? In 1918, yes. uh, particularly uh, because of the war, because of World War I, uh, uh, the, the, the flu traveled from Kansas to, uh, to, well, to the Philippines, to France, to really everywhere in the world in the first wave um, uh, from, a, from a camp, a military camp, rather, in, in Kansas in the spring of 1918 uh, uh, throughout the rest of the world in that first wave that died down over the summer of 1918 and then reemerged in the fall in France, uh, and then quickly um, uh, transmitted itself across the world. I mean, I, th- I think in, in some places, the, 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 the increase in, or the war-related troop movements clearly spread flu into places, you know, parts of India and into Iran, Iran and, and other places. But in, on, in Africa... Most of the transmission there was was done not so much because of the war per se, but because in South Africa, for example, which had one of the most extensive rail lines uh, for trade and transportation of, of goods and, and people, uh, you can almost uh, there's a great article um, by a historian whose name I'm blanking on who maps out uh, the transmission routes of flu and more or less in Africa and more or less overlays them with river and rail networks. Uh, to show that um, uh, that these you know emerging and quite robust transportation networks in Africa were the exact routes by which flu uh, was transmitted, and so it, it would have you know traveled across most of the world, I would imagine, counterfactually speaking, without the um, without the war, just because transportation networks had become so robust by that point. I want to move on to a, a more recent uh, one, the Ebola virus, 2014 mm-hmm. to 2016, and you write about uh, that in your book as well. I want to play a video uh, that is very recent. Dr. Michael mm-hmm. Ryan, who is currently the head of the WHO's Health Emergencies Program, on the lessons that the world learned from Ebola. Let's listen. 
What we've learned in Ebola outbreaks is you need to react quickly. You need to go after the virus. You need to stop the chains of transmission. You need to engage with communities very deeply. Community acceptance is hugely important. You need to be coordinated. You need to be coherent. You need to look at the other sectoral impacts, the schools and security and economic. So it's essentially many of those same lessons. But the, the lessons I've learned after so many uh, Ebola outbreaks in, in my career are be fast, uh, have no regrets. You must be the first mover. The virus will always get you if you don't move quickly. In your book, you write that the WHO's lessons learned about Ebola was a striking document. So uh, what did you observe and what are you hearing from, from uh, doc the doctor there and Dr. Ryan? Sure. Um, you know, if, 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 if it's easy for you, um, it would be maybe you could read exactly what I wrote, I mean, I know what you're talking about. I, I focus on this in the epilogue, and I'm happy to respond. Yep, the importance of community and culture, the importance of capacity, and that markets-based systems do not deliver commodities for neglected diseases are some of my takeaways from what you wrote. Right, right. Yeah, so those are, that's what you, the thing you just, the, what you just read, thank you, is um, from the WHO's reflection on, on the lessons learned, their, you know, official publication on what lessons they learned from the from the Ebola epidemic, and and my point in the in the book, and what I would just reiterate now, and, and I think I would say, you know, the the same thing to the, the in, to the doctor who was interviewed. Although, to be to be fair to him, um, you know, he's responding to interview questions, so I and talking, you know, presumably somewhat off the cuff, and and it's really the official H WHO document that I think is the more powerful. Um, example of, of the point I wanted to make in the book and that I'm happy to reiterate here is that it struck me as a historian that reading that in 2015 that I, it was difficult to imagine um, that, that those really could have been lessons learned in 2015, that they, I, was, I was somewhat struck that those lessons hadn't been learned earlier, uh, that the, you know, we need to have the capacity to take care of public health emergencies uh, strikes me as a lesson we've learned over and over again, that market-based solutions to public health crises in under-resourced areas um, is something we've learned over and over again, and, and, and the need to engage with local communities to, to get buy-in, to make people understand you know, why particular interventions are being uh, rolled out, the power, if there's a vaccine available, uh, the power, if there's a cure available, of those things, um, you know, as historians have learned those lessons many, many, many times, and I know that public health officials have learned those lessons many, many times. So, it's just struck me at the time when I was finishing up that book and, and reading that document um, that this is a perfect way to end a book on the history of pandemics uh, to illustrate the point that historical consciousness is 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 somewhat superficial. You uh, have already referenced the role of smallpox in uh, the uh, development of society, chronic until uh, declared eradicated in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, does it remain eradicated? Yes. In, well, you know, it does, yes. Uh, there's no real caveat to that. I, I will say, though, recently, and I'm going to get some of the details wrong, and I apologize, um, but uh, you know, within the last three or four years, um, I remember reading in the, in the newspaper, and again, I'm getting some of the details mixed up, but that uh, you know, someone found a, 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 sm a sample of the smallpox, you know, in some storage room, you know, somewhere at the NIH. You know, so there are these these examples of you know, it, it is stored in, in secure facilities in a couple of places in the United States and, and elsewhere, but it's been eradicated um, uh, from the world. Yes, that eradication program was was led by the World Health Organization in yep. the 1970s. So, what um, can society learn from that big effort? The pluses mm -hmm. and minuses that we can apply to contemporary issues. So that's a good question. Thank you. I think that um, so on the minus side. Now, this isn't so much a a, a reflection or a criticism of the way that the that the eradication effort was handled, so much as as wanting to point out that, um, that the example of eradicating smallpox, while heroic, um, isn't necessarily a useful analogy for, say, eradicating something like the flu or coronavirus or tuberculosis um, because of the peculiarities, um, as I and others you know, have pointed out, um, 
of smallpox. You know, it's easily identifiable. It has a relatively short incubation period, um, and it's very susceptible um, uh, to a vaccine. And so there are particular things about the disease that made it more eradicable than other diseases, like tuberculosis or, or, or malaria or something. Um, so it's just that you don't, one doesn't want to uh, lump all infectious diseases together and say, oh, we eradicated smallpox, therefore we can eradicate these other infectious diseases. But each disease's identity, I, I think, matters significantly. Um, I think that what, what lessons to be learned that are uh, about the smallpox eradication effort, and I would say at the early years of the effort to control tuberculosis, um, is that in both cases, and I can say more about the tuberculosis effort if you'd like, but in, in both cases there was this tremendous, um, and you see this in many, many intervention efforts across the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, um, a tremendous amount of energy uh, and goodwill and dedication and um, particularly, and not in all instances in all places, but... but um, follow through and sustainability, for lack of a better way to put it. So, you know, the smallpox eradication campaign, um, you know, the WHO have been working on smallpox for, um, for quite some time, but when they launched the official campaign in the late 1960s, they, they worked at it until it was done in the late 1970s, you know, a little bit more than 10 years. And the, the point of that is that it was a sustained effort uh, that had a goal, and there was uh, sustained support of that effort until the goal was reached. Um, and that sounds like a really simple point, uh, but too often um, it seems to me, you know, we we res- we collectively respond to something, uh, and then once um, there's an initial um, initial flurry of activity and things start to look better, interest is lost. Uh, momentum is lost, and um, and people move on. And I think that in the the ways in which the WHO Medical Research Council uh, responded, for example, to tuberculosis throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and into the 70s, is another example of extraordinary um, longevity. I mean, this group of researchers and public health officials worked on the the problems associated with vaccination and with antibiotics um, for for decades. Uh, rather than than giving up quickly. Well, well, either talking about smallpox or TB, it it seems a good point to ask uh, from a historian's perspective. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on the anti-vaccination movement? Is it unique in this time period, or have we seen other similar responses by subsets of the public in the past? Oh, absolutely. Um, Yes, we have seen other examples of anti-vaccination movement. And, you know, they have, I I will say, and I hope hope I I can be slightly... um, well, I don't think it's in politic at all. I will say that the current anti-vaccination movement um, it seems to be based entirely on misinformation uh, and fear-mongering, and it's, com- I, I think, really, frankly, a bankrupt movement that has no should have no credibility. Um, uh, and I apologize if I sound a little too intemperate about it, but I think it's 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 it has no credibility whatsoever. Thinking about it historically. Um, when vaccination was new and poorly understood, uh, and you can imagine why people would would react in fear, similar to the ways I, I will say why people may react in fear to vaccinations now, they they understand them poorly, but that's not because of lack of information available. Um, in the past, people reacted to poorly to vaccination uh, for for a couple of different reasons, but I'll I'll say one. Um, Two, two different instances in England uh, in the late um, 19th century when vaccination became compulsory. Um, people reacted poorly to that because, and, and not, not, not you know, a tremendous amount of the population, but people reacted poorly to that because uh, just like now, uh, people don't want the state uh, um, uh, meddling in what many people perceived to be a private decision uh, to compel someone to get vaccinated uh, strikes many people as overstepping by the state. In, um, in my t- tuberculosis book, I write at length about an anti-vaccination movement in India um, when the WHO rolled out 
the BCG vaccination campaign in the late 1940s and into the 1950s. This was organized uh, by a group of people who um, really questioned the efficacy of the vaccination. And the, the, the effort was, um, was largely targeted at what they perceived to be um, almost the imperial behavior of the WHO. You know, so you can imagine in India, uh, they've just gained independence, and within two years, um, the WHO is in the country um, uh, insisting on vaccinating hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of children with a vaccine that isn't very well understood. And people had a, you know, there was a significant anti-vaccination movement uh, for several years, particularly in South India, as a result of, again, what many perceive to be this almost imperial-like behavior of the WHO, because the WHO at the time didn't do what the WHO now says it should do in, to, you know, in, in response to Ebola. They didn't engage with the local community. They didn't um, get community buy-in to the, point, to, the, at the, to the degree they should have. So there was significant anti vaccination movement, resulting in, in many places in India when it came to TB vaccination, um, almost zero response rate to vaccination campaigns um, in, the, in the mid to late 1950s. We have about uh, 12 minutes left, and, I, and okay. this, we're doing uh, this overview of these very complex diseases, which yeah. it, it doesn't do them as much justice. But you've ref- yeah. referenced malaria a few times. I want to talk about yeah. that, and I want to talk about HIV AIDS. Uh, briefly. So on malaria, again, some facts we, from the WHO. The persistence of this is very impressive. 228 million cases worldwide, 405,000 deaths. This is from 2018. Children under five account for 67 percent of the deaths, and Africa is home to over 90 percent of the cases and deaths. Uh, you, in the book, trace the disease to as long as 10,000 years ago. So it's been mm. with us for a long time. But mm. you write that uh, successful efforts to eradicate malaria have been elusive. Mm -hmm. Um, The Gates Foundation, which you reference, is one of the private sector players that's getting very involved Mm -hmm. in this. What can we take away from the global efforts to address malaria and their lack of success to date? Boy, um, malaria is, uh, you know, it's the reason I'm hedging is because it's been it's been one of the most difficult diseases to deal with, as the numbers you 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 um, cited suggest. Uh, it's so difficult because it has so much to do with the with with the environment and the mosquito vector uh, and the emergence of drug resistance to malaria. That it's you know it, mosquitoes and the disease itself become resistant to the drugs that are designed to fight it. And that happens over and over and over again. Um, and so it's proven to be a disease that, um, well, frankly, resists human efforts in many places, particularly in tropical countries, uh, to its spread. Uh, you know, the, the, I alluded earlier to um, the efforts by the WHO in regards to tuberculosis for a long time and then smallpox um, for a more limited period of time in the 60s and 70s. You know, and I said that one of the things that I find um, useful as historical lessons is that in both those instances, the WHO and others persisted for a very, very long period of time. And, you know, there were mistakes were made, and tuberculosis is still, you know, with us, and so we didn't get rid of tuberculosis. But in the case of malaria, the WHO also attempted to eradicate malaria. Uh, beginning in the 1950s, and it was the first uh, eradication campaign for any infectious disease. And um, it failed in places for a whole variety of reasons, but, but in, in places like India, for example, um, you can see very clearly, um, historically, when the, w, when, the small, when the eradication campaign was at its height and household spraying was, uh, uh, was, was robust, uh, infection control was robust, um, you could see malaria rates dropping. The second all of that was pulled back um, and, and interest was lost in controlling malaria, um, disease rates uh, skyrocketed again. So it's been, yes, one of the most difficult um, diseases in, in human history to control. There have been, of course, successes in, uh, in southern Italy in the 20th century, um, uh, uh, in the United States in the 20th century, um, 
but there's been far more um, cases of failure in controlling malaria than there have been successes. On HIV uh, AIDS, uh, it seems like much more of a success story. Here are statistics. It was first identified in 1981. It took until 1985 for a test, and then 11 years later to have a therapy. But with HIV AIDS, what was once a death sentence is now Mm. for people with access to drugs, a manageable chronic illness. Mm -hmm. Uh, The United States made a major commitment, especially towards Africa during the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. We have a very brief clip of of President Bush in 2003 that we're going to watch. HIV AIDS is a tragedy for millions of men, women and children and a threat to stability of entire countries and of regions of our world. Our nations have the ability and therefore the duty to confront this grave public health crisis. We are here today to urge both houses of the United States Congress to pass the emergency plan for AIDS relief which will dramatically expand our fight against AIDS across this globe. What would you say are the greatest contributors to the success story uh, that Mm. I just related in in treating HIV and AIDS? Well, so I just said, you know, I I remember, um, and you, you know, you may as well, really vividly when George Bush first announced PEPFAR, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, uh, during the State of the Union. And it was... It was true, and I show these clips, and I read um, his remarks in my class, and I'm giving my lecture, and it really is one of the. I mean, I really have to say, I, for 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 his faults, it was one of the most uh, remarkable uh, um, pieces of legislation. It's a really moving um, speech that he gave, uh, and it and it and it showed an extraordinary commitment that is is hard to um, find an analogy for in our current crisis. Um, the successes in AIDS, you know, and I, I, I want to think about this for just for a second because if you, if you periodize the response to AIDS, the period that you first referenced, you know, in the early 1980s um, through the um, emergence of antiretroviral therapy and its, its ability, you know, its release onto the market in the late 90s, particularly after 1996. The period from 1981, roughly, to 1996 is a 15-year period where um, global, the global response was, was chaotic, and um, the recognition of it as a, as a profoundly, uh, as a disease that would profoundly affect the heterosexual population, um, the realization that it would affect women uh, as much, if not more so, than men, um, you know, these things took a very long time to catch on, and the global response was chaotic. And so there's a lot of, in those fir- first 15 years, that one wants to point to as, as examples of lack of success. Um, and I don't mean to be such a downer about it, because you're right, after 1996, in places where drugs have been available, uh, rates have su- been successfully um, uh, taken down. Uh, and PEPFAR, of course, was one of the first, if not the first, Major, it was the first major global effort to get antiretroviral therapy into communities where it was otherwise um, uh, completely um, unaffordable. And so after PEPFAR, you do see rates of HIV um, going down in sub Saharan Africa in particular. Uh, and it, it really was, there's kind of a before and an after PEPFAR period. Um, the one thing that that I think has been a, uh, one significant thing I would point to that has not been a success um, and, and, and has gotten better in very recent times is the, is the relationship between HIV and tuberculosis. I mean, H- HIV and, and tuberculosis, whereby um, in the very, very early years of the um, AIDS pandemic, it was very, very clear that these two diseases were going to have a synergistic relationship that... Um, HIV, because it attacks the immune system, would leave people much more susceptible to tuberculosis. Um, where HIV first emerged was where TB was still not under control. 
Um, and doctors, public health officials, realized this very, very early in, in, in the emerging HIV pandemic and attempted to, to work on it. Um, ultimately, that, those efforts were, um, were um, unsuccessful and largely um, uh, forgotten and ignored and you know, not, not given funding. And TB and, tuber- TB and HIV were treated as two separate diseases operating on, on not, if, if not parallel paths, um, at least contemporaneous ones. And what ended up happening, in, in my view, is, is a um, TB, and not just my view personally, but a TB-HIV pandemic that could have been contained uh, far better than it was if the two diseases had been, had been as they originally were, thought of as working um, synergistically because they feed off of off one another. So where HIV uh, emerged, TB almost always um, skyrocketed. By the early 1990s, HIV-related tuberculosis was threatening, particularly in East Africa, um, to erase all efforts um, of the previous several decades in, in getting TB um, manageable. So uh, our, our time is uh, running out here, sure. and I want to sort of bring this full closure here. I want to tell people that are watching this that your book, Pandemics, is, is widely available online for purchase if they want to read more about some of the diseases that we've talked about here and get a, a, a deeper look at them. But mm. to bring it to current time, so if you're looking back past all the lessons that we've just discussed being learned, mm. what's most important for people to think about with the current pandemic mm. uh, as, the, as the world approaches it? Yeah, I mean that as a citizen, of course, that's you know, with and I have a family, and I uh, my current job, uh, we're man- trying to manage um, how to get all of our classes online and take care of our staff and our students and faculty. Um, you know, th- the best thing to do is is listen to the identified experts, and in this case, it's WHO and the CDC, and um, and social distancing closing down public gatherings um, and doing these things now and taking them seriously and doing them for long enough that, um, you know, do not relax uh, the vigilance. Don't take good news as a sign that it's time to stop being vigilant. Uh, All the lessons from cholera to uh, influenza to the really the, the these infectious diseases suggest that the vigilance must go on until rates um, start going down consistently and over time. I mean, the only way to stop something like this is to stop the spread of the contagion. I mean, that should be obvious, but and the only way to do that is to limit contact with one another. And so, to take the advice um, and the directives of public health officials particularly, again, CDC and at the WHO, seriously, and do what you're told. Uh, the, in, in, in the 1918 pandemic, it's very, very clear that the cities in the United States that took early action in, in, in shutting down public spaces and kept that action up throughout the fall of 1918 and into the winter of 1919, um, that is, they were consistent and, and they sustained their efforts. They are the cities that had the greatest success um, with mortality rates during the 1918 influenza. We don't have pharmaceutical interventions available yet. We only have public health interventions. Um, and so, so that's what I would, that's the lesson, the single best lesson. Listen to public health officials who know what they're talking about. Do practice social distancing. Um, don't rely on a vaccine arriving uh, anytime soon. Dr. Chris McMillan, UVA historian, associate dean for social sciences and author of the book Pandemics. Thank you so much for adding a historical perspective to our current pandemic situation. Thanks for your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.